Hello, I'm Ollie Hemmings. I'm here with Pete Creech. We are Heart of Argyle Wildlife Organisation. Welcome to our virtual school visit for the Craig Nish Native Oyster Restoration Project. Today we're at Ardfern Yacht Centre where we'll be showing you how we collect the data once the Covid restrictions have lifted and we're allowed to do school visits on site once again. This is a really exciting five year project and it will involve at least five schools or more. We will be taking records once a month during the oysters growing season. We'll start each session by collecting a wide range of data about the conditions on the day and these will include things like the wind speed and direction, the temperature, the sea temperature and general weather conditions as well as having a look at the sea state and the tides. Here you can see that uh, Pete has been recording the wind speed and direction using an anemometer which he will hold up in three different places or three different directions and then he is attaching a thermometer to the end of a piece of rope that will be roughly measured to about a meter's length and he's going to drop that into the water now and hold it down there in the water for um, a few seconds, a minute or so, um, we'll be able to record the water temperature where the oysters are living too. All of this information will then be recorded on our monthly data sheets. The data we collect will build up over time and ultimately this will contribute to other data being collected by other oyster projects in both the UK and Ireland. All of this helps contribute to a picture of the conditions in which the oysters are living and what will be needed for them to thrive and how they affect the marine environment around them. Pete here is um, bringing up the first of our oyster hoisters, which is a cage which contains layers of oysters. There's about a hundred in each of these cages. We have six or seven of these cages hanging off uh, the pontoons in the marina. These are our oysters for observation, which are the ones that the schools will be measuring and recording. Um, we've got other oysters out in the bay. There's about 60,000 oysters have been released into the wild in the bay. They clutch together, stick together and form sort of reefs to, to alter the marine environment and create homes and habitats for lots of other creatures too. Over the five years of the project, we hope to be able to release about a million oysters back into Craignish Bay. But these ones here in these hoister cages are for us to observe their growth and record the data about how well they're doing. So, once we've opened up the first layer of the cage, we can have a look at the oysters inside. The first thing we can see is that there are lots of sea squirts attached to them. The oysters in the top layer of this sort of oyster block of flats are some larger ones we put in there. You can just see a smaller one attached to it there. The The idea of um, looking at them in detail is we can then see what other creatures are living in and around them. We've already mentioned the sea squirts, we'll find those are both on the oysters and in the cage. There's another small creature there. Um, we only really managed to uh, assert that it has legs so we'll need to get the keys out to see if we can identify that and then we can add that to one of our lists of species and there are other, other small things attached so there's seaweed that's attached to the oysters you can also see here that their their shells are different between top and bottom with a one flat side and one rounded side the rounded side here the paler shell is the growth that that those little oysters have put on in the previous year so all in all they're doing pretty well the Oysters cling together, and you can see already that some of them already starting to do that, to form the reef that uh, Ollie was talking about earlier. This shell has barnacles living on it, so that's one of the other species that will benefit from having an anchorage, if you like, on what is often the, the muddy bottom of the lock. This one has a worm living in a cast. You can see that, that curly piece of pipe that it looks like is actually a calcium carbonate cast that protects the worm.
So once we've had a look at the life that's living on and around the oysters, the next thing we'll do is weigh some of the individual oysters and we'll record the weight of them month by month in the hope that they are increasing in weight as well as size so we can record how fast that they, they develop and grow. This will get written down on the monthly data sheet of course and all of this data will be accumulated over time. The hope is that uh, each child in the school class that visits can have their own individual oyster so that if you visit again in the future then you can identify a single oyster and be able to see how your oyster is getting on. So we're doing a bit of an experiment here using nail varnish to put coloured dots on these oysters so that we can identify them again in the future. As well as the oyster cages, we also have a couple of creels out. These are um, cages, if you like, that are used to catch lobsters and crabs. And we are going to use them so that we can see what other creatures are sharing the seabed with the oysters. Um, and of course this might change over time as the oysters start to have an effect by building their reef and populating the lock again. It also gives us some idea as to the type of competition the oysters might have. So for example there are some starfish in and around this creel and starfish will eat oysters. But all of these creatures and lots of others besides will benefit from the, the things that the oysters are doing. The one thing that we haven't mentioned about oysters so far is that they're filter feeders. So all the time that they're feeding, they are removing particles from the water, making the water clearer and cleaner. And that will benefit all of these crabs and starfish and sea urchins and all the other things that are, are living on the bottom of the lock. In another pot we have some scallops or scallops as some people call them. Uh, these are bivalve creatures so like oysters and mussels bivalve means they have two parts to their shell. Unlike the oysters they don't stick to the seabed they are free moving and they're also filter feeders. You can see this one is slowly opening up to reveal the big strong muscle inside that holds the two parts of their shell together. And when they do this in the sea, they're sucking in the water, which they'll filter the particles out of. And then they move by snapping shut their two parts of the shell, which it'll do in just a second, like that. And that propels them through the water onto the new place. We had one final creole to have a look at. And one of the first creatures that came out of this was something slightly different. It's a velvet swimming crab. And you can see that its rear legs are broader than those of the, the green shore crabs that we see everywhere. This, this gives this crab the ability to swim because the, it's got a broader pair of paddles, as it were. So that one's gone off back into the lock. And also in here are a range of other crabs and starfish. And we'll have a look at the starfish next. So just reaching in to persuade one of those to come out. Um, starfish are, are pretty incredible creatures. They're related to sea urchins. Um, they have a kind of strange capacity when they're eating things to, um, as it were, remove their stomach from their body, which they can then envelop whatever they're eating, and then pull the whole lot back in again, which makes possibly starfish's table manners a bit odd. The other species that's worth noting in this um, collection are hermit crabs and that's a whelk shell I've just pulled out. Hermit crabs have a soft body so they need to find a shell to live in in order to keep them safe and to stop them being eaten. It's always a bit of a challenge for a hermit crab because when they've outgrown one shell they have to then go and try and find another and at the moment I'm just trying to persuade one of these hermit crabs to come out because it's it's kind of somewhat underhoused. So there's an awful lot of the hermit crab that can't get back into the shell. What you would normally see is just their, one of their large claws closing the entrance to the shell. Uh, this one desperately needs to move house and I think what we're going to do 
is well there's an example house for it um, it might decide to take up on that but we're about to put it back in the lock um, and kind of wish it the best of luck on finding a new home before something eats it so that's the end of our video for today. We hope that you've enjoyed uh, seeing the things that we hope you'll be able to come and do with us in the future and help us record all the things that um, are in the marine environment and uh, wish the oysters the best of luck for the next five years. <laughs>